Sapelo Island. This is the example of barrier islands we will be using for the duration of this video. So here's the barrier island. Notice the beach on the seaward edge. We will come back to this in a moment. On the far left edge of the photo is the Georgia coast. This is the coastal plain. In between the barrier island and coastal plain lies the salt marsh. The marsh is cut by several creeks that serve as inlets for the tidal water to enter and exit the marsh. Tides are crucial for the development of barrier island salt marshes. Barrier islands are dynamic in that they experience a great amount of change due to storms, tides, and wind on a short time scale, as seen here. Here are two stratigraphic columns we will be using to explain the change of depositional environments on barrier islands. Stratigraphic columns show a sequence of rock units and are arranged with the oldest rocks on bottom and the youngest rocks on top. For our purposes, ignore the transgression and regression in scales on top. We are interested in the depositional environments listed on the right of each column and the correlating figures drawn on the columns. We will use these as a guide to understanding the unique characteristics of each environment and how it's seen in the geologic record in relation to the other environments. But we are only going to focus on the top portions of each column and we'll refer back to these throughout the video. Here are the environments as they appear on shore and now we will work our way through them beginning with the foreshore environment. The foreshore is marked by the high tide point and the low tide point. Essentially, it's the beach. As the water is pushed on and offshore, several kinds of sedimentary structures can form, such as current and vortex ripples that reflect the intensity and direction of flow of the waves. Seen here are small-scale 2D current ripples, and they can tell us the direction of the flow of the current. Here are the lee sides of the current ripples, and these are the stoss side of the current ripples. And the lee side always points towards the direction of the flow. Another example of sedimentary structures are rill marks, in which the dendritic channels always come together in the direction of the water source. Here's a large berm. Berms are formed by the deposition of material by low energy waves. They are above the water level of high tide. They typically slope towards the ocean on the seaward side and then reverse their slope on the landward side. Typically, along the margins of the berm, you can find burrows which are sometimes preserved in the geologic record. Referring to our strat column, we see the foreshore and backshore environments, or stratigraphic facies, in which the back shore is a transition into the beach dune environment. The squiggly lines next to the foreshore represent the preservation of burrows. Uh, the dominant lithology for barrier island stratigraphic facies is sand, which is shown as dots to the left. Now, we will move from the foreshore to the back shore, showing the change in layers of materials that make up the sand and why it changes in the first place. Here are the dominant minerals that make up the sand. The crystal clear mineral is quartz. The black mineral is ilmenite, which is an iron oxide. The green mineral is epidote, and the reddish brown mineral is rose quartz. These minerals are actually the products of weathering from the Appalachian Mountains over millions of years, in which the mineral grains were transported by rivers until they were deposited at the coast. This is the lower foreshore. It is very saturated and is comprised of shell fragments, organic materials such as ghost crab poop, and the heavier minerals like ilmenite. As we move from the lower foreshore to upper foreshore, we begin to see a distinct banding form. Geologists label these bands either laminations or beds depending on the thickness. These bands reflect tidal deposition and storm events. When the bands are seen close up, a distinct break between the lighter crystal clear quartz 
and heavier mineral ilmenite becomes apparent. Now we are transitioning into the backshore environment, where we see more quartz and less ilmenite. This is due to quartz being a less dense mineral than ilmenite, thus it can be carried further upshore with tides and storm surges. The laminations of ilmenite you see are the result of increased energy in the waves, allowing heavier minerals to be pushed into the backshore environment. We have finally reached the dunes. Here, uh, wind is the dominant force in shaping the dunes. They lie parallel to the coast. Vegetation can grow in the dune environment, which helps to retain the structure and slow erosion, and is represented by the symbol that looks like a root. We can look underneath the dunes to see the history of earlier dunes and their movement through time, which is called cross stratification. Here is a clear cut surface of cross stratification and some roots of the vegetation from above. The salt marsh is found on the landward edge of the barrier island and extends out to the coastal plain. Uh, the salt marsh itself is divided up between the high marsh and the low marsh and that distinction is made based on the uh, high tide mark and the effect the high tide has on the marsh itself. Within the marsh we can see different types of vegetation, burrows, and even critters themselves. Spartina, uh, sea daisies, fiddler crab burrows with uh, the characteristic balls of sediment near the opening of the burrow, uca burrows, uh, oyster beds, and ghost crabs. In the event of a storm, the surge can create a washover deposit, which is sediment carried from the beach inland over the protective dunes. This deposit can then bury tidal marshes, which is represented on our strat column by the squiggly line. And this is an unconformity, which is created by the erosion and deposition from the storm. Here's a relic marsh, which is a marsh that was buried by a washover deposit and has recently been uncovered. But as you can see, all the Spartina stalks that are broken off uh, were all killed by the washover, and which also includes all of the organisms that were living within the marsh itself. Well, here's the washover deposit, and as you now know, you can see these ripples, and the lee side is facing us, and you know that that is the direction in which the water was flowing at the time of deposition. Also, if you look um, on the top of all the ripples, you can see ilmenite grains, which were deposited as the energy of the water uh, dropped as the water spread out over the washover deposit. Well, that's it. Enjoy some pretty pictures and wake up those that are asleep next to you. Thank you.